Welcome to Kitchen Table Talks. I'm your host, Stephanie Seaton. The purpose of these table talks is to have an informal chat with those who have shaped the field of bioethics and to provide information about educational opportunities for those who, like me, are interested in learning more. This is episode seven, Clinical Bioethics, featuring a discussion with Christine Bishop, Emily Lisi, and Gerardo Maradiaga. This is brought to you by Wake Forest University's Bioethics Graduate Program. We're so glad you're here. Please pull up a chair and join us. Thanks everybody for joining me on Kitchen Table Talks today. Today we're doing our clinical bioethics um, program. I previously have talked to Dr. John Moskoff, which is why he's absent from this particular group, um, lead clinical ethicist at, at Wake Forest Baptist. But we have some great people here that all work in clinical bioethics in some way. So I'm gonna have them introduce themselves. Why don't we start with you, Emily? Um, so I'm Emily Lisi. I'm a genetic counselor by training. Um, I'm currently the new program director for the genetic counseling training program here at Wake Forest. That is so cool, congratulations. Thank you. Chris, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Chris Bishop. I'm a neonatologist and um, I'm the director of perinatal supportive care. I previously was at Wake Forest and then just in the past couple of years have moved to University of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm also a bioethicist trained at the, at the Wake Forest um, program. Great, thank you. And Gerardo? Hi there, my name is Gerardo Maradiaga and I'm a clinical ethicist here at Wake Forest uh, Baptist Health. Um, I work with the aforementioned John Moskov with our clinical ethics committee, um, and I'm also a course director for a first and second year medical school entitled um, MAPS, Medicine and Patients in Society, of which Chris Bishop used to be a uh, course director when she was here um, uh, in Wake Forest. Great, thank you all. We have a, quite a variety of vocations here, so I'm really excited to get to hear more from you. So first, we're going to talk about what comes to mind when we talk about clinical ethics or what topics um, do you think of when we bring that up? Chris, how about we start with you? Sure. So I, my interest in, in ethics developed as my uh, interest in neonatology increased. It's all through training and because um, neonatology is just full of ethical situations. Um, from the prenatal realm to um, the clinical care of, of the mother baby dyads and decisions that families have to make. And so, you know, to, to me, entering into discussions and learning about clinical ethics was very much went hand in hand with my clinical work. So um, I think a lot of things come to mind when I think of clinical ethics, but that, that I think is at the top of, of the list is this, this practical expression of what we do every day. That's a great coverage. That's great um, explanation and definitely leads us right into what Emily does. Would you go next, please? Yeah, so I have a very similar answer to Chris in that um, I was a clinical genetic counselor for many years and was always interested in ethics, but as genomic medicine has um, increased so much and become such a bigger part of medicine, so have the ethical issues that are um, part of that. So I... Um, started the master's in bioethics part-time a few years ago because of my interest and, and have really um, been able to kind of understand those issues more and, um, and think about them in ways that I never had before. Um, so when I think of clinical ethics, I think sort of in the genetics realm in terms of assisted reproductive technologies and prenatal testing and carrier testing and you know even end of life issues that, that are associated with, um, with clinical genetics. Right, both of those areas are quite fraught from what I've learned in my experience in bioethics program here. Um, Gerardo, how about you? Yeah, so when I think of clinical ethics, um, certainly build, building on what uh, Emily and Chris have said, um, I think of the work that I do here on a day-to-day -day basis, um, think of the sort of three arms of the um, ethics committee. So that's education, that's policy, and that's consultation work of which I get to do in my role. Um, um, pretty much daily. So um, 
Yeah, um, they're all kind of intertwined. Um, they're all very important. I think most people tend to focus mostly on the consultation when they think of clinical ethics, but um, I would argue that the other two, education and policy uh, development, are just as important, if not more important, um, than the actual consultation work that we do. Um, so yeah, we, we address um, many of the issues that have already been mentioned. Uh, in my line of work, I, we tend to deal mostly with beginning of life and end of life issues. Um, a lot of ethics, but honestly, a lot of just communication and care coordination type issues. Um, and so having background in those different areas, certainly very helpful to the work that I do. Um, so yeah, that's how I think of clinical ethics. Great. Obviously, the education piece is near and dear to my heart, but I recently spoke with Nancy King and Anna Iltis, and they they told me about creating policy and how actually that was part of their favorite part of the job, getting to see what you've been working on translated into the real world. And each of you is exposed to that, uh, I'm sure, every day in your jobs. So what vocational opportunities exist? I know we, we've kind of heard about your position. Are there others that you can think of in your area? Let's start with Gerardo. Yeah, um, well, again, I mean, I tend to think of just the role that I do as a clinical ethicist. Um, it's a role that is certainly, um, I think, growing. I'm seeing more of those roles pop up in different institutions. Um, I'm trying to think of your question, how to, how to do it justice, uh, in terms of other roles. And are you thinking about other roles in bioethics? Mm -hmm. or, Anything that has to do with bioethics that maybe you touch on a day-to-day -day basis, who should be exposed to that and how would it, how would it impact their vocation? Yeah. Well, I mean, I like to think that, um, just about anyone can be a bioethicist, <laughs> um, in terms of, um, uh, in the work that they do, right? So of course, physicians um, deal with ethical issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Social workers, chaplains, um, risk managers, these are people that I work with on a daily basis. Um, and so I think having some you know, bioethical training or bioethics, exposure to bioethics certainly enhances those careers, right? So I, I certainly don't believe that um, addressing or dealing with bioethics issues is something only a clinical ethicist can do. And I think, again, seeing someone like Chris Bishop, who uh, was a physician first and then got the training to in bioethics um, is living proof of how having that degree can enhance um, the roles that you do. But yeah, I mean, I, again, I don't think uh, ethical issues are something that only clinical ethicists can address. Um, uh, I'll give you an example, you know, um, a lot of, for many years, um, we at this institution were addressing a lot of ethical issues at the end of life. Uh, and that now is mostly done, I would argue, by palliative care physicians. Um, and so um, certainly having bioethics expertise or um, experience or background is certainly very helpful for them. Um, and in a way, it's helped us because we don't have to address those very difficult issues. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I also do work in this institution um, with the IRB. And so having that sort of research ethics experience has certainly helped me and enhanced the work that I do. Um, and it's a nice way to kind of not focus solely on the clinical side of things, but also to address some of the uh, research elements. And with COVID last year, um, it was interesting to see how um, the research side of things and the clinical side of things kind of intertwined. Um, so more so than in, since I've been doing this for about 10 years, that was the first time where really those two domains um, really intersected. Um, on, on a daily basis here. So um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but uh, I think there's a host of opportunities to, to engage in bioethics work. And, um, and it's not just someone who is a clinical ethicist who's engaging in those issues. I think you perfectly addressed my question. Um, that actually leads me to another question though. Chris, in your training, did you receive a lot of ethical based or ethics based training? prior to starting the program here? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, through medical school and residency, it, it really wasn't a prominent part of my training. I sought it out just because I had some previous interests. And so when I could you know, choose different, different things to do during medical school, I would choose those as my little electives or um, things like that. But it was never really heavily integrated into the curriculum. 
Um, where I really started to see it was, you know, during my medical training and in practice, asking those questions every day. And, and it's this, um, this concept, like in palliative care, we talk about specialty palliative care skills and primary palliative care skills. And it's almost like the co concept of primary ethical skills that every um, healthcare person, person taking care of patients should have and should, should really be familiar with. And, and for me, my path led to things like, you know, talking about best interests with, with families and what's in the best interest of a child and weighing, um, you know, goals of care and, and concepts like what's in mom's best interest and what's in baby's best interest and how do you make a decision? It, weighing those two things, um, who's the decision maker, you know, all kinds of really practical policy, almost law things down to, you know, sitting at a bedside with a family and talking about the ethical issues involved with treating their, their child at the end of life. And um, is this opiate, is this morphine going to kill my child, you know, and, and hasten their death and, in you know, having those kind of conversations with family. So, you know, I think that that's where it gets woven in. And, and I, in my clinical practice, I, these questions kept coming up over and over again. And so I said, you know what, I am going to get a master's and I'm going to learn the answers to all these questions. And anybody who's studied ethics knows that that is not how you find the answers to questions. You learn how to ask better questions, right? And how to create frameworks to think about things and how to, how to really look at these situations in a critical way. And then the whole concept, like, like Gerardo brought up about research and, and empiric ethics, empirical ethics and doing research in the realm of ethics. So, you know, as a physician, I'm an academic neonatologist who also does perinatal palliative care and research and things like that. And it touches, bioethics touches every area of what I do um, from, you know, applying for the IRB, you know, applications for different studies that I'm, I'm on or working with to these conversations that I have with families to working with medical teams to talk about, you know, different, different ethical issues. And um, during our morbidity and mortality conferences, as we're, as we're looking at, um, you know, how the care of a, a particular child went or things like that. So it is, it's very interwoven. And, and after training at Wake Forest and, and um, having amazing mentors like Dr. Mossoff and Dr. King and Dr. Iltis, um, you know, I was also had the privilege of being able to do clinical ethics consultations with Gerardo and teach the, the and create curriculum for the MAPS course for medical students and really take a deeper dive into those things. Um, and it's only enhanced the way that that I'm able to, um, you know, practice bioethics here now and, you know, in my next position and really weave it into the, the work that we do so that now the students coming through and the residents and the fellows we talk about it a whole lot more and, and trying to really integrate into that everyday practice. So it's like pharmacology and like anatomy and things like that, because it is a really big part of what we do. Wow, thank you. It's almost difficult to figure or to find a, an area in medicine that this doesn't touch. I, I don't know that there could be one. But that goes into Emily, what, how do you use the knowledge that you've gained in the program? Yeah, great question. So um, I didn't necessarily know what to expect before I started the program. I just, you know, was interested and, and wanted to learn more. And um, I've been kind of amazed at how applicable what I've learned in the program is relevant, both to clinical genetic counseling, um, but now more so in my educator space. Um, so the genetic counseling program that we've created here has an emphasis in ethics for obvious reasons, um, but we are, you know, hopefully going to train students in ways that they haven't been trained before necessarily to think about ethical issues in, in different ways. Um, and I'm actually going to provide these, these modules that I'm creating for our program to other genetic counseling programs as well so that they can um, train their students in these ethical issues that, they, um, that they're going to face on a daily basis. And, and like Chris was saying, I think one of the key components is how to think critically around these issues and understand that you're not necessarily going to get to a right answer all the time, um, but, but knowing kind of how to think about things in different ways and the concepts to use to help you um, do what's best for the patient is is just really key and important technique. Yeah, that's a great point. That uncertainty or not being able to come to a right answer, like you're saying, uh, and being comfortable in that space, I think is huge, especially for 
I mean, especially for the jobs that the three of you do. That's incredible. Um, I'm going to wrap this up by asking what your hobbies are. Chris, do you have a hobby? Do you have time for a hobby? <laughs> I know you said you were going to ask me. I was like, oh man, I don't think I have anything interesting to say, but you know, I, I have two kids and I, you know, my, I love what I do. I love my work and, um, you know, and I put a lot of time and energy into it and, and, you know, but my family truly is the most important thing in the world to me. And so, you know, if somebody says, do you have a hobby? It's like, oh, go into my son's soccer game and then playing soccer with him in the backyard and, you know, um, you know, doing things with my daughter. And, and so I have a 16 year old and a 12 year old and, um, you know, really, you know, being with my family is, is what I do in my free time. And it doesn't really matter what, it's just, it's always something. And, and that is, it's what fills up my cup and, and keeps me balanced. So it's not really a hobby, but it's, it's uh, the most important thing to me. I think it's a really valuable way to spend your free time. So hobby or not, I agree. That's great. Um, Gerardo, how about you? Yeah, so um, my hobby is uh, I have a medical orchestra that I'm involved with. And um, it's uh, actually was started by a medical student here in Winston-Salem about six years ago. Um, and it's been growing over the last couple of years. And um, so it's actually, it started out as a hobby. It's become almost like a mini second job of sorts, uh, but it's great. And what I love about it is that, I mean, it, it brings people of different uh, walks of life. Um, we have members from the community, we have uh, trainees, we have physicians, and um, it's sort of just everyone there is pretty much an equal, you know, um, and so it's great. Um, and kind of like bioethics, which is a field that brings in all these other disciplines, this medical orchestra very much feels like that as well. So um, yeah, I love it. If anyone who's watching this video is from the Piedmont Triad region here in uh, North Carolina, we're always looking for uh, new musicians. Uh, so please reach out to me. That's so awesome. What instrument do you play? I play the trombone. Wow. <laughs> we're always looking for more strings and, and I mean, any instrument really, but yeah, um, it's a lot of fun. And it's a great, uh, it's a great stress reliever. Um, at least the playing. I'm not sure if the organizing the group is a stress reliever, but the playing certainly is. Music really is therapeutic. That's why we have whole whole therapies derived of it, out of it. Um, Emily. So I, I think my my answer is probably similar to Chris's. I don't have a ton of free time right now um, with with you know mid to young children. Um, I will say I really like to cook. Um, that's something I enjoy a lot during COVID um, was, you know, learning new recipes and cooking and, and doing new things. So I like to do that. Um, and I, to that end, I'm trying to start running again. So I'm not sure I would say it's a hobby I enjoy yet, um, but um, yeah, it's one I'm, I'm working to improve upon. We'll put it that way. <laughs> Thank you all for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your really busy schedules to do this and to and to talk to people that are interested in bioethics or in our bioethics program here at Wake Forest. Thanks again, and you all have a great day.